Salina, um, uh, to kind of put some context to how he fits in the picture. So Charles Boswell, who's been with us the last couple of weeks, his son Matt is the lead pastor at the Trails Church in Salina. So Josh is on loan to, to us for, for the next three weeks. Uh, Charles is out of town and has some other engagements. So I'm uh, glad to have you with us, brother. And uh, with that, if you guys uh, will just welcome Josh, we'll get started. <laughs> Please grab your Bible and join me in the Gospel of John, chapter 10. Thank you, brother. Well, it is great to see you all and be with you all this morning. I bring greetings from uh, the trails, your neighbors, about, uh, what, 45 minutes? Was that the drive? Uh, west of y'all on 380. Um, I know today's text is likely familiar to many of us. Uh, who, who hasn't heard of Jesus being the Good Shepherd? Uh, if, if you've been raised in the church, this is likely a familiar text. But what I want us to see this morning is this text actually invites us to consider an importantly crucial question. And that question is, who is Jesus and what do I do with him? Right? Who is Jesus and what do I do with him? This is the central question that divides religions from each other. So kids, if you're ever wondering what's the difference between a Christian and someone else, it's this question we're going to talk about today. Who is Jesus and what do I do with him? This is the difference between Christianity and false gospels and cults and all these other things. It is the question that eternities hang on, is who is Jesus and what do I do with him? But it's not just that, it's the question that really is the undergirding question of our worship. Every day, moment by moment, we're asking in our hearts, who is Jesus and what do I do with him? And in today's text, we see that this is really a, a continued extension of this question and conversation. Because in John 5 through John 9, so whenever we read the Bible, we want to see the stories like this are in a context. And that's what's happening. In John 5 through John 9, you see this rhythm of Jesus healing people, explaining more of who he is, and the people wrestle with who is this guy. Right? So just to kind of walk us through, in John 5, Jesus heals a paralyzed man on the Sabbath. And the people wrestle with, who is this guy? On what authority can he do this? And in John 6, Jesus feeds a crowd of 5,000. And people wrestle. He says, I'm the bread of life. Most of his disciples leave. And people wrestle with, who is this guy? In John 7, he's teaching. And the people say, could this be the Christ? And he says, I'm here. More, more guarded than that. But people wrestle. Is this true? And that leads us all the way to John 9. We're in, right before what we're about to read, Jesus healed a man born blind, and this man became his disciple. And the religious leaders kicked him out of the temple. And what we see is that this story in John 10, where Jesus has this exchange, is, is speaking to a crowd of Pharisees and the man, everybody who would have been around. And the context of the story shows us they're still wrestling with this question, because at the end we're going to see. They're still wondering, who is this guy and what do we do with him? So, after our time today, we are going to discover, whether for the first time or with fresh eyes, who Jesus is and what do we do with him. Jesus is the shepherd who loves his sheep. And we are to respond by following and worshiping. And so, uh, I, I want you to know what my heart is for you this morning. There's a context behind what we're going to look at. Um, as Daniel mentioned, I've spoken with Charles and with Daniel. I, I know you guys are in the middle of looking for a pastor. And so, as I kind of come in for the next three weeks, my hope is just to help you know that while you may not have a pastor today, you are being pastored by King Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. And so, that is what we're going to look at. My hope over the next three weeks, Lord willing, is just to simply lift up Christ and say, look at him. Let's behold him. And let's look at these different aspects of what our great shepherd is like so that you and I can walk away each week and go throughout the week worshiping Jesus with rock-solid confidence that we have a shepherd who loves you, who knows you, and who is working in you, both individually and corporately as a people, to display his greatness to Farmersville and greater Collin County and ultimately to the world. That's what me and Max were talking about on the drive here, is I love that uh, while, while uh, we prayed this right before we walked in, while we were worshiping here in Farmersville, my church, the Trails Church, was praying for y'all in our time right now, and we were worshiping together. And we're just a small little piece of this, right? The nations one day will be worshiping Jesus, and that's what all of this is for. So this is the path we're going to take over the next three weeks, is those little chunks, looking at the, a shepherd who loves you, a shepherd who knows you, and a shepherd who is working in you to display his glory to the nations. But it starts with us asking this question from this text, who is Jesus and what do we do with him? So as we study God's word this morning, we're going to find three things. First, Jesus is the shepherd who gives us life. 
Second, Jesus is the shepherd who gives his life. And third, what do we do with the shepherd who loves us so much? And so I'm going to read God's word. would love for you to read along silently as I read. This is God's word for us this morning. It is true. It penetrates our heart. It, it, the Spirit uses this word, which he has written through uh, the Apostle John, to, to shape us and change us and help us love the God who has created us. So receive it with faith. This is God's word. John 1, starting in verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep do not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have a life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand, not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own. My own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Yet others said, there, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Would you pray with me? Father, in this text, Jesus comforts us by telling us that we are known. Perfectly known. You know every heart seated here. You know what we need. Jesus even says that just as you know your son and he knows you, so he knows us and we know him by faith. Lord, would you help us to see more of that mystery today? You invite us to know you. You call sinners like us friends and children through the finished work of Jesus. You've given our son, your son, to be our shepherd. And I pray that through your word, you would help us to see him for who he is and to worship him for all of our lives. Please do this work. Open our eyes to see what we cannot see. Help us treasure you more as a result of reading your word this morning. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So at the end of John 9, if we were to read up just a little bit, we would find that Jesus is having a conversation with this man who had just been given new sight, right? He became a disciple, and the Pharisees over here see this. You see this just up a little bit. If you look at verse 40 of chapter 9, it says, Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things. So they clearly were within earshot as Jesus is talking to his brand new disciple. And they ask, are we blind? Because Jesus is using this whole metaphor to kind of let, flesh out here um, the differences between sight and blindness. Uh, spiritually. And it's in this point that Jesus is addressing this little crowd, whoever would have been around, that Jesus tells this story, which the text says is a figure of speech. So that's like a little story with a point, right? Uh, and he tells of a shepherd who goes into a sheepfold to call his sheep. He specifically emphasizes how the sheep responds to the shepherd compared to how the sheep responds to a thief. So to get a picture, the sheepfold back then would have been a communal place. So it would have been a place, kind of like a co-op, right, for sheep, where all all of the people would have brought their sheep, put them in the pen, and they hire someone to sit at the gate and they, hey, don't let anyone in but the shepherd of these sheep. So, Jesus is saying, look, a thief comes through the back door and tries to not get caught, but the shepherd walks right in, the gatekeeper says, yo, what's up? And, and the shepherd walks right in and the sheep hear his voice and respond. So the whole reason why Jesus is bringing up this story is to emphasize the response of the sheep. If you look here, um, and we're going to be looking at this text a lot, so please feel free to keep... Uh, 
uh, your eyes on it and, and see what we're seeing here because the words call and voice are repeated here regularly. And that gives us an insight into what the point of what Jesus is saying is. He says regularly, the sheep hear my voice. They don't respond to the voice of the robber. So the big idea is that their sheep respond to the shepherd they know. And so, uh, you know, I'm in, I'm in the suburbs of Salina. It's not very rural there. And so if, uh, I'm assuming not many of us are shepherds. So to put this in some context that uh, we, we might be more familiar with, imagine going to pick your kids up from the kids area or from a daycare. What happens? When I go, I have a little three-year-old uh, and a seven-month-old. When I go to get my three-year-old from our, our kids' ministry, he typically is playing with all the kids. And as there's a big line of parents waiting to pick up their kids, he doesn't pay them any mind. Right? He just keeps playing. He just keeps playing with the kids kids, but the second he hears my voice, he hears daddy's voice, either talking to a friend or not even talking to him, he just hears my voice, but if he hears me say, Graham, what does he do? He drops whatever he's doing and runs to his father. We get this. This is what we're seeing. The sheep respond to the shepherd because they know him. And these comments that Jesus is saying have deep roots in the Old Testament, specifically Ezekiel 34. So I want to just help us see, put some context, because this is going to hopefully help this text pop when we see the beauty of what Jesus is really saying here. Ezekiel 34, 4 has the Lord indicting the leaders of the Old Testament because they are not shepherding people the way that they're supposed to. God says this, The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. Think of how fitting this would have been. As here is a, a man who is born blind, who comes to Jesus, the great God of the universe, and what do they do? They kick him out of the temple. Here the religious leaders were fitting in the same mold as these shepherds back in Old Testament history. But then, that's not all. Look at what God says in Ezekiel 34. I'm going to read it for us. This is verses 11 through 16. So just seven verses after giving this indictment of the, of the religious leaders at the time who were not shepherding, shepherding the people. Here's what God says. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture. And on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. And hear this. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the straight, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. Think of how that would have been ringing in the ears as we read Jesus saying, He is this great shepherd. You see, Jesus, the great shepherd, had come to redeem his people, and yet the people are confused about who he is. He heals this man who had been blind since birth, and the people are angry about him. They're arguing about what's going on. And Jesus' point is really very simple. The sheep of God respond to God. That's what we're seeing here. They're responsive. The whole point of the story is to introduce that the shepherd calls to him and the sheep come to him. And that's going to help us lead into this next section, which we're really going to study more deeply. Because they didn't understand it. It says right there, this was a figure of speech, and they missed the picture. Thanks for this cool story. What do I do with it? That's the equivalent of what's happening. Uh, theologian D.A. Carson helpfully notes that Jesus doesn't necessarily explain the illustration as much as he expands on it. We might expect him to say, well, what do you mean by he's the, you're the door? Or what do you mean by the shepherd? But he doesn't necessarily get into the technical explanation like he might the, in the parable of the sower. Instead, he set up this scene, and then he uses these little pictures to say, hey, hey, see these pictures? They say something about me, Jesus. That's what he's doing here. So as we follow, I want us to see two key insights that are really going to guide our time in who Jesus is as he's using this expansion to talk about how he is the door and the shepherd and how all of this relates. So the first thing we discover is that Jesus is the shepherd who gives us life. Look in verse 7 with me. At first this might seem a little off because, wait, Josh, you just said he's the shepherd. Well, he says he's the door. Well, that's right, and I'll explain how this all relates. Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Now, door is an entry point. And by saying he's the door, he's using this illustration to teach, I'm the way to life. I'm the way to come and know God. 
uh, he points out how the people who came before him were thieves and robbers. This could easily be applied to the false religious teachers of the, of the day, these Pharisees who had set up the law as this means of knowing God. But more specifically, it likely refers to these false messiahs that popped up in the history of Israel. These revolutionaries who said, look at me, I'm going to lead us into the promised land. And they ultimately led their people into destruction. So Jesus is saying is that every, the, the people who come before him in this vein, this false vein, the people didn't listen to them. The true sheep of God, some people listened. You know, some people follow their ways. But the flock of God, they did not listen to him. But now Jesus has come. And he's welcoming people into life. And people are responding. People who the Pharisees didn't expect are responding. And Jesus is helping them understand what is going on. The people of God are coming to God. In verse 9 through 10, Jesus repeats that he's the door, but he also explains what he provides. He says, if anyone enters by me, notice this, what do they get? He will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. Now notice how this harkens back to the promise of Ezekiel 34, where God promises that he himself will be their shepherd and that he himself will bring them into the safety and security and pasture. And that what we're finding here is, is the going in and out and finding a pasture and the salvation are linked as if to say your biggest problem in your life is your sin. It's not a circumstance issue. The biggest problem about me is me and you. The biggest problem about you is you. The biggest problem we have is our sin. And Jesus is helping us, or helping us see that he's promising salvation from that biggest problem. He's not here to try and just try and fix all elements of our life, make us better people. He's here to save us from our sin and God's wrath against it. So here to be saved is to have the wrath of God satisfied for you so it no longer hangs over your head. So you become now a child of God who's fully beloved, fully accepted, and declared righteous because of the work of Jesus. And if that's true about you, you have security and safety. You go in and out. You get the pasture of God himself. Because God is the end goal. So that's what Jesus is saying. Is I've come to be, everyone who comes to me will be saved and I come to save them. And that, that's the next thing. He compares his intentions with the metaphorical thief here. Right, you notice the thief, he says, the thief only comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Sorry, I messed this up. Steal, kill, and destroy. But notice this. I came that they may have a life and have it abundantly. And here we find the first insight I want us to spend some time meditating on. Is that Jesus came to give you life. Jesus is the great shepherd who gives us life. Now, it's worth saying, because of our context, something about this phrase, abundant life, there are people in North Texas and all around the world who would have you think that an abundant life is freedom from suffering. An abundant life is health, wealth, and prosperity. It might be freedom from hell, but also a Lexus should be somewhere showing up in my driveway, right? And that is not true at all. We have to understand that Jesus is not offering an easy life, but eternal life. And so what we want to understand here is that what Jesus said as an abundant life is not something that is caught up in worldliness. That would be like a millionaire father just constantly giving gifts but refusing to spend any time with the son. What does the son want in every situation in that context? Who cares about the stuff? I wish I had my dad. And so people who buy into this lie of the prosperity gospel, that's what you're trading. You're, you're trading God for stuff, which is the same trade all of us has made. Romans 1, it says we know God exists, but yet we've all worshipped the creation instead of the creator. And so we just have to understand, just because of our context, that this is not the abundant life that Jesus is saying. Instead, Jesus is saying this is the life lived to the full, life designed for what you were made to do. Because when you come to me, I give you my spirit, and I save you by bearing the wrath of God for you. And God the Father now brings you in as a child and the Spirit enters into your life and empowers you so that you begin to now live the way that you were designed to live as a human, which is to treasure Jesus Christ above all. Can you imagine? So much of our life is because we don't see God, the great treasure of the universe, as worth treasuring. We see other stuff as so much more valuable. But if, if something could reorient us to where we begin to treasure things that we should actually treasure, that's life. And that's what Jesus is saying. But let's meditate on this a little bit more. Our hearts need texts like this, friends. Look at how explicit this is. It says, Jesus came. There's intentionality there. Just like I came today to do something with you. Jesus came from on high, incarnated, became a human to give us life. 
It's not the sole reason, but one of the real meaningful reasons why Jesus came was because he wanted to give you life of eternal joy in him. And just what does that show us about God? It shows us that he is incredibly good. I know in this room there are tons of stuff in my heart and your heart that we're wrestling through. And the question might be, is God good? We, we have to look at God's word and see, yes, Jesus came to give us life. He's gloriously good. He is undeniably good, and this is immeasurably good news. And so we need these reminders that Jesus came to give us life, because I'm sure at different points throughout the week, you and I wrestled with thinking that Jesus was stingy, right? We may not have vocalized this with our words, but if we think through our week, there's some point where either we responded in some sort of sin or we were scared of something, because at the end of the day, we don't really believe that God is really a life giver. We tend to believe, or our thoughts tend to accuse God of being stingy. He's stingy of grace. He's stingy of mercy. He's stingy on forgiveness. Whatever it is, there's a, a sense, our default setting of our heart is to think this way. And this is really the same lie that Satan has used all the way from the beginning. When he said, look, Adam and Eve, God isn't really that good. God isn't really that for you. This continues to be hidden in our hearts. And so I just want to ask, where do you see this in your own heart? Satan, our great enemy, wants you to think that God is a life taker instead of a life giver. But look at what this text says. He came to give you life. The world tells us that God's design is backward and oppressive. We can often feel like his demands are limiting or life taking. Why can't I just do that? There'd be more joy. The world says there's more joy on that side. We're drawn to the lie that our life is found in our stuff, our hobbies, our phones, our bank accounts, our families, our activities, our popularity, whatever it might be. The flesh, the devil, and the world all tell us that life is about us. So we just so easily buy the lie that if it's about us, it's going to bring us happy. It's going to make us happy. It's going to bring us joy. But when we mix all these lies together, the byproduct of that is nothing but self-worship and rebellion and unbelief. So we need to believe this truth. In fact, the only truth to get the stingy ideas of Jesus out of our heart is the gospel of Jesus Christ and meditating on it daily. It's the only antidote to this heart condition that we have. And so here's what I want us to do. I want us to see how this kind of shapes us. Dane Ortland is an author and a pastor. He's helpful here. He says this. I'm going to read a quote from a book he wrote. It says, The Christian life, from one angle, is the long journey of letting our natural assumption about who God is over many decades fall away, being slowly replaced with God's own insistence on who He is. This is hard work. It takes a lot of sermons and a lot of suffering to believe that God's deepest heart towards you is merciful and gracious and slow to anger. Because the fall in Genesis 3 not only sent us into condemnation and exile, the fall also entrenched in our minds dark, low thoughts of God. Thoughts that are only dug out over multiple exposures to the gospel over many years. And this is where I think might be most helpful. He says, perhaps Satan's greatest victory in your life today is not the sin in which you keep regularly indulging, but the low thoughts of God that draw you there in the first place and that keep you cold to him coming near to you. I believe that that's true, not only conceptually, but experientially, and I'm sure you do too. In the recesses of our heart, we see this dynamic playing itself out where we don't see God the way that we should, and that impacts everything. And that's why this is so essential. It's an insight that helps us see who our shepherd is more clearly, that he is not a life taker. No matter what our unbelief in our heart and our enemy might say, he is a life giver. And so what should we do? Are you struggling right now with thoughts that paint Jesus as stingy? In your hearts, are you struggling to believe that God really is as for you as he says he is? I want to give us the prescription that Philip gives to Nathaniel in John 1, 46, where he says, come and see. Do you fear that God will not forgive you for your sin? Come to him and see. Do you fear that he's stingy to continue to keep giving you grace, to continue to keep receiving you, even though you thought you should have figured this out by now? Come to him and see. Do you feel unusable for the kingdom and for the advancement of his glory? Come to him and see. He doesn't leave any of his people astray. Do you think that you need to figure your life out in order to be received and really embrace deep at the heart? Come to him and see. 
what you'll find is Jesus is the shepherd who gives us life. And he does this because he loves us. And he does this by laying his own life down, which leads to our second insight. This text shows us that Jesus is the shepherd who gives his life. Verse 11 starts with the classic I am statement. I am the good shepherd. And he describes what makes a good shepherd. He says it right here. You'll see. He says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Notice, the good shepherd is qualified by the act of laying down his life. And he compares this to the hired hand in this situation. Jesus specifically emphasizes that the hired hand is not a shepherd because he does not own and therefore does not care for the sheep. You have to see this tension because that's the whole crux of Jesus' argument here. He's making the point quite clearly that a shepherd lays down his life for his sheep because he loves them. They're his own and he cares about them. They are his and he is theirs. The whole task of the shepherd is to know each sheep, to know their individual demeanor and makeup, to know their name and to care for them, to provide the task of feeding and caring and nurturing and cherishing individually these sheep and collectively together as a flock. This is the task of a shepherd, and that requires love in order to do it well. And that's why this word cares that we see in this text is so important, because again, it's the momentum of what he's saying. Notice the hired hand does not care for the sheep. He says that right there. The hired hand does not care. So what happens? He's just there to make a paycheck. So the second there's a threat comes, he's out. Right? But Jesus uses that as a negative example to highlight the positive example of his care and his love for his sheep. And what he says is because I love my sheep, I lay my life down for them. He is the good shepherd. Notice how he says he knows his sheep and his sheep know him. It says here in this text that just as the father and the son know each other. Notice this is a mysterious, beautiful reality. Just as the father and the son perfectly know each other. So Christ knows his sheep and his sheep know him. This is only possible through faith in, our, in, in being united to Christ. But what this says to us is that there's a type of love and intimate knowledge that God has of you and that you have in return if you are a child of God. This is why it's only possible through Jesus, the mediator. And this all leads us to the hallmark of Jesus' ministry, the ultimate expression of his care, which is his death on the cross. The progression goes like this, flowing out of the mutual love of God, the Father, that he has for his Son. <laughs> this is wonderful. The triune God determines the love of people who are his own. And so he sends the Son to come and to die as their substitute. This word for, notice, he lays down his life for the sheep. D.A. Carson talks about how in the Gospel of John, this is incredibly important for us, this word for is only used to refer to substitutionary relationships. So Jesus died for somebody. And so kids or friends, it's like subbing out in a basketball game, right? If you sub in for me, you take my place and you're getting hooped on. That's what this looks like. It's as simple as that. It's a substitute. He's going in to sub for us. And that's what he's saying. After defining the good shepherd as one who lays down his life, he then says, I am the good shepherd because I've come to lay down my life for my people. And so you see, why is a substitute needed? It's worth asking. Well, a substitute is needed because his sheep are in trouble. The rebels. Every single one of us. We've rejected God and are worthy of condemnation. But the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, the perfect triune God, loves his people. And so the Father sends the Son, the son, co son comes to lay his life down to ransom a people for God, is what Revelation says. On the cross, Jesus died in your place, and he bore the full wrath of God like a sponge. So that now today, Christian, he soaked it all up, and there's no more wrath left for you. Not because you don't deserve it, but because it's been dealt with fully. And notice how Jesus teaches the intentionality of his actions. He knows what he's doing. Jesus was not blindsided by the crucifixion. He says, <laughs> look at this, no one takes it from me. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down. That's the language of sacrifice. He came and he laid his life down by being lifted up on the cross. And as Christ marched toward Calvary, he had the glory of the Father and the good of his people on his heart. And he bore the wrath of God so that you and I would taste none of it. This is Jesus. God himself coming to be the shepherd of his people. Just like it says in Ezekiel 34. So what should we do with this? How should this reshape our low thoughts of God that we're so prone to have? How should we see? What should we do with the fact that Jesus is not only the shepherd who gives us life, but he does this by giving his life? It should show us how deeply God loves you. 
And notice the order of this, friends. I just want us to see. In what reason does Jesus ever give for laying his life down? It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with you. Why does God love you? Why does, that, why does Jesus love his sheep? It's not because of the sheep. It's because God loves them. Notice this. Some of us in this room float through regular rhythms of insecurity and despair because we wrestle so often with this question. We wonder, does God really love me knowing everything he knows? I've heard the one thing that often keeps us from assurance is the fact that when we look in the mirror, we see a sinner. Surely God sees that too. So what do we do with this? How do we wrestle with this insecurity? Well, it all comes back to answering this question. Why does God love you, Christian? If you think the answer has anything to do with you, which is how most, like, the default heart operation is, that's how my heart always operates, I tend to think that's something I do. Well, here's what that does. It creates this mentality where we think, what I need to do is look within to fix myself. And if I can just fix myself, then God will be more happy with me. Because that's what everything else happens in the world. Go to work, do better, my boss likes me more, I get a raise. Surely it's the same way with God. But the problem is, the more we look inside, the more we just see more brokenness and darkness that we can't fix. We try. We try to do the right step. We try to do the right thing. But it just keeps coming back. So we're just left with, how do I fix this? That's the whole point, is we can't. The more we keep focusing on us, the more it just creates the more insecurity and reasons to be afraid that God's love is lacking. So what do we need to do? We need to let this shape our hearts because if we, th- if we think that God loves us because of lust, it will only lead to destructive as- aspects in our soul. It will lead us toward legalism or self-righteousness or just despair all the time. That's why we need the Bible, to reorient our hearts to see what is really true. The, the reason that Jesus lays down his life for the sheep is simply because he loves the sheep. There is a loving, sovereign God who is for his people, and that is the, the heart of this whole text. And so we need this text to show us how greatly we're loved, not because we're lovable, but because he is full of love. Right? Here's, here's what we so tend to see. We are prone to love people who we think are worthy. So we treat people who do us right better, and we love them a little bit more, right? Jesus says that. He says, don't be like that. The tax collectors do that. But notice what he says. He says, your father loves the just and the unjust. There's a sense where what we see, and here's what I was to see. When we think that God the Father, that, that the triune God loves us because of us, we actually not only hurt our souls, but we distort God's perfect and wonderful love. Because while we love people based on what they do, what we see is God loves the unlovable and makes them lovely. And that's part of what makes them so beautiful because none of us do that. You know that word holy, there's a moral sense to it, but what it actually means is to be set apart and this is what we're talking about. God loves in a holy way that is unlike anyone else. And that's why he deserves glory amongst many other things. It's because when it comes down to love, he does not love like we do. He loves because he loves. And that is the root reason why Jesus comes into our world, takes on uh, human form, becomes fully God and fully man, lives a perfect life and lays down his life to redeem us from sin. And so, Christian, I just want you to hear, just as Jesus is no stingy miser, Jesus is not a hired hand. The devil wants you to think that not only is he stingy, but he's a reluctant redeemer. That sure, he maybe brought you in, but now he's just kind of annoyed that you're there in the sheep. Couldn't be further from the truth. Because he did not lay his life down for you because of anything about you. You are a vessel of mercy that he chose to simply love and lay his life down for so that the whole glory of God might be manifested to the lost and sinners might be told through you and through the gospel, come and have life. And so I just want you to know, dear Christian, that Jesus is not regretting dying for you because of your brokenness. And if you had all feel that, just like in the day and day in, out of the day, that was a weird sentence, day in and day in of the day. As you go throughout your day, if you just feel like the sense of like, surely God regrets this decision. Like at least he's faithful to his promises and he'll keep me. That's where we, we need to be reminded of what this text says. He doesn't feel that way at all. He loves you. That's why I laid his life down. Here's what Dane Ortland says again. It's helpful. He says, we naturally, and listen to this, kids. I think this is going to be a helpful image for all of us. We naturally think of Jesus touching us the way a little boy reaches out to touch a slug for the first time. Faith.
face screwed up, cautiously extending an arm, and the second to touch it, this yelp of disgust, right? And instantly withdrawn. And then he says, this is why we need the Bible. Because although that's our natural inclination is to believe that, the Bible deconstructs it all and shows us who he really is. So what I hope you see about your good shepherd is that he loves you, not because of you, but because of him. His love for you is not rooted in anything that we do, but is rooted solely in the fact that he is for his people, and that's why he lays down his life. So what should we do when we fear that the love of God is lacking? We look to the cross where we see the love of God forever proved. And as we behold the cross, what we find is that the lamb who is slain is the shepherd who loves his people. That leads us to our last one question. What do we do with this guy? What do we do with the shepherd who loves his people? The response of the people help us understand what this passage is all about. In verse 19, we see here, it says there was again a division among the Jews. There's more disagreement. They're still wrestling with who is this guy. Some of them say, don't listen to this fool. He's got a demon in him. And other people can see the facts and say a demon can't open the eyes of a blind. So what do we do with them? That's the question undergirding all of this. The central question that underlies all of this text is one of belief. There are two hints that help us understand that. Because again, I, you shouldn't believe it just because I'm saying it. I want you to see in the text. If you look a little bit lower, to verses 25 through 28, you'll notice the next time he talks about the sheep. Look right there. 25, Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. They asked him, look, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, just tell us. Be straight with us, Jesus. He says, look, I've been straight with you, but you don't believe. Then notice the why, 26. You do not believe because you are not my sheep. So this shows us that the whole point of talking about the shepherd and the sheep is one about whether or not you are going to believe that Jesus is the Christ. The fundamental question is, who is this guy? What do we do with him? And he's answered it. I'm the Christ. Will you receive me or not? But the second hint is from John at the very end of his gospel, which is the key to reading the whole gospel of John. He says this in John 20, verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And listen to this, that by believing you may have life in his name. The whole Gospel of John was written to this end, that you would believe and have life. So the question on the table for us today is one of trust. Who is Jesus and what do I do with him? Some of you might be here and you do not know Christ as your shepherd. Instead of finding life in Christ, you've been captured and you're willingly enslaved to the lie that you are your own God. You live your life thinking that whatever you think is right, is right. You're, you love your sin. You rejected Christ. And right now you're trapped and condemned in your sin and your unbelief. But I want you to notice the invitation that Jesus gives you. Notice how gracious of a shepherd Jesus is. The enemy wants to keep you stuck in these wrong lies of God that say, surely you're too far gone. But look what Jesus says. If anyone enters by my name, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved. It's the beauty of the gospel call. is that if you're here, as long as you stay outside the door of Christ, you will remain in the pit of darkness and under wrath. But the invitation from Jesus on the authority of his word right now, today, is that if you come to him and trust in him, he will give you life. What does that trust look like? It looks like turning from your self-reliance, turning from being your own God, turning from your self-rule and rebellion, and saying, I am desperately broken. All that stuff that Mr. Josh said, listening to what's going on in my heart, I can't fix myself, and I need a shepherd to lead my soul through the way. And there's only one way to have this life in this pasture, and it is Jesus. And so, for you, I want to invite you, on authority of God's word, what we've read, he says, if anyone comes to me, you will have life. So listen to Philip and Nathaniel. Come and see and come and have life. But for others, you know Christ, the great shepherd. He is your shepherd. What do you need to do with this, Jesus? This is not just a question that we have to answer once, as if we raise our hand and we heard what Josh just said about coming to Christ the first time and that's it. That's not what it's like. This answer to the question, who is Jesus, what do I do with him, is the daily question in the battleground of worship in our hearts. Is Jesus truly a good life giver? Or is Jesus a stingy, reluctant redeemer? The answer to that question will shape the way we worship in everything. And so I just want to encourage you. Let these texts do their work. 
Let the Spirit shape your thinking throughout the week by taking specific moments to personalize this and say, Jesus is my shepherd. In moments of temptation, when the enemy in your flesh want to take you towards thinking that something else will give you life, remember Jesus came and he is life. When you're prone to think of your past or listen to accusations or whatever, think of what Jesus did. He died for you because he loves you and you rest in this. So my hope is just simply put, if you're a Christian here, that you will be able to see with fresh eyes today that you have a shepherd who loves you. That you have a shepherd who loves you. And that you will walk around the rest of this week understanding Jesus is my shepherd. And that collectively as a people, you will understand that Jesus is our shepherd. Here at Trinity Baptist Church. And he will lead you. So Jesus died so that we might no longer live for ourselves. And that is the way that Christ calls us to operate here throughout the rest of this week. Is dying to ourselves so that others might live. So who is Jesus? He is the shepherd who loves his sheep. And what are we to do with him? Whether for the first time or continuing until glory, we are to trust and treasure him above all. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your word. We thank you that you are incredibly kind and gracious to us, that you feed us weekly through the proclamation of your scripture. I pray that if there are people here who do not know you, that God, you, by your spirit, would just take your word and create new life. Call people to yourself so that they might come and know you and be saved and come in and out and have the pasture of joy in you. And for all of us, Lord, who are here and who are your sheep, I pray that you would help us to see the type of shepherd that Jesus is to us. That he is a gentle and lowly shepherd. That he loves us. He does not lead us with an oppressive rod, but rather one of grace and kindness and compassion. The enemy wants to make us think wrongly, and we ask, God, that you would protect us from that. But also throughout the rest of this week, help us to think and just worship you and come to Jesus with renewed confidence as the great shepherd of our souls. That he would receive us, that we might live for his glory. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.